joining. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. All right, great. Hi, Stuart. Hi, hi, Debo. Yeah, good to see you again. Good to hear your voice again, like this way. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, so yeah. right now I think I'm going to mute everyone wow. and give out the instructions. So good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming on board. Right now we have Stuart Forest, we have Debo from Animation West Africa, and we have Brian K from Taro Studios. And thanks all once again for coming on board to the first ever CG Africa webinar. And tonight we are looking to some exciting 17 minutes ahead. And we will be listening to a couple of our speakers presenting their experiences and giving us tips on how we can improve and develop the industry as we go along. Um, we hope people will be joining us as we go along, as we progress. But I want to state quickly that the recording of this presentation tonight will be made available on YouTube and on via the forums on CG Africa so that participants and people can have an opportunity to ask questions even after tonight. So I would implore you to please uh, check these forums. I will be forwarding the links anyway as each speaker make his make his presentation i should also say quickly that we will not be taking questions after each individual speaker rather we will be taking questions after all our speakers have spoken this is so that we can keep it brief and uh, straight to the point so i will start quickly by introducing formally everyone i will start with um, myself uh, my name is Femi, and I will be moderating tonight. And inside uh, tonight also, we've got <clears throat> so we've got Stuart Forrest from Triggerfish Animation, and he will be talking about the opportunities of the animation industry in Africa. And next, I'm sure these speakers will introduce themselves properly as they have the opportunity. And the next, we have uh, Emmanuel Ajetomobi. He is from Hybrid Animation, and he will be discussing one of the challenges facing the industry, talking about software and hardware. And next, we've got, uh, we have Sendebo which I've spelled his name wrong on this one. He's the founder of uh, Animation West Africa. He'll be talking on another challenge, face, challenges facing the industry, talking about technical know-how. And the next we have uh, Harry Dunku. He's the creator, creative director and founder of Scroll Entertainment. He'll be talking particularly on how concept artists can help for that and uh, the creation of local contents in in, Niger in in Africa. And we have Brian Taros from Kenya. He will be talking about the importance of the social media, using social media to generate content and to promote the content in within the continent. So those are speakers uh, this evening. And I would like to invite Stuart Forrest really to start with his uh, presentation because um, I will give him his, this floor now so that we go straight to to the point. Uh, let me see if I can unmute this from my end. Great. Well, thanks, Femi, and thanks, um, CG Africa, for this uh, great opportunity to, to speak to 
people throughout the continent. I think it's a great initiative and uh, I, I think very uh, necessary. So um, well done for putting this together. Um, I'm going to speak mostly to what I know uh, and, I, and I want to first um, have a disclaimer that I don't know everything. And I think uh, as you, I've spent a lot of time in Hollywood and whenever you speak to people, uh, they often precede the, the conversation with, uh, you know, we, we don't know anything and, um, and anybody who says they know everything doesn't really know much at all. So uh, I wanted to start there saying I, I'm going to speak mostly from my experience in the, uh, the feature film industry and my new experience with the TV series. But I think uh, there's been a lot of learning that in the next uh, eight to try and that as possible. And then we'll have questions at the end, I believe. So the, the, the main talk, the main theme of what I want to speak about is uh, the in how to increase our role on the global stage. So our, our company, Triggerfish, is focused globally. We've always had that global uh, focus. And, and it goes right back to uh, right in the beginning when it's, Triggerfish started doing the first work that we did. So I'm going to start with just um, a little introduction to Triggerfish and, and how we've been engaged, and then I'll go on to a more broader uh, what the industry is like here on the continent. So the, we, we started in 1996, so um, two years after the end of uh, apartheid and the, uh, the, the new uh, liberated South Africa, and we going now for 21 years. Uh, our first uh, productions, our first, when I, my first production when I joined the company was the, when we were doing work for Takalani Sesame and uh, we tried to get inspiration from the things that, are, that we saw around us that, that were quite unique to the, our area. Animation using plastic bag chickens and uh, wire um, chameleons and things like that. It went down really well. It went down well in, uh, in South Africa and it went down extremely well in uh, America as well. And in the end, we ended up doing about eight seasons of Sesame Street for the US domestic, the international versions, and uh, that became our bread and butter. So we did about 10 years of, of just working on Sesame Street. What was interesting about that uh, collaboration was that the, the New York-based Sesame Workshop would send us the curriculum goals for the preschool, for the, for the children, and then we would come up with the storyboards and they would uh, really work closely with us to get those storyboards to work. And doing stuff for preschool is actually quite challenging because we've always had a, 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 a goal at Triggerfish to make stuff work for parents as well. There shouldn't be anything that the parents don't smile at as well. So we always have to try and make it work on all levels. Then in 20, 2009, we went into uh, CG animation. Uh, we, the, the first stuff was all stop frame, so we had cameras and lights in the first stuff, but that went through a really rough patch and we ended up having to change the whole company to be a CG animation. And then um, uh, Sendebo actually joined us on, on the beginning of, of, of Zambezia and some of the other works that we did. But we did some uh, uh, small, short, 15 minute, 20 minute, 30 minute uh, animation, CG animations. And then uh, Zambezia was our first 85 minute feature film and, and then after that, we did another 85-minute feature film called Kumba, and that was released in 2013. Uh, straight after that, we realized we, we didn't have another script ready for another feature, so we ended up uh, doing some service work for the, um, a company called Magic Light, who did some work for BBC One, and Stickman was the first one that we did of that, and that it was a huge success and it was awarded the, the top prize at the Annecy uh, International Film Festival uh, as the, the best TV production uh, of that year in, in 2016. And then the following year we did uh, uh, Roald Dahl's Revolting Rhymes. Uh, it was 50 minutes of 
uh, animation. Some of it was done in Germany, but we did the most of it. And that was an, uh, also re received the best TV production uh, in Annecy 2017. Uh, we're currently working on another one for BBC and Magic Light, and that's uh, work that we do uh, for BBC, which has been terrific. Then we've got a, another feature film that we've uh, have a, been writing for about four or five years, and uh, we've just got the funding in place now, so we, we should be starting on that uh, quite soon. That's a, a, a 90 minute feature film uh, that, will, that we, are. we hope to start as soon as the paperwork gets done. So that's in a, in a nutshell what we've done over the last 21 years. And uh, I think the, there's been quite a, uh, it, it's been really successful. Uh, you know, the, the, the journey has been hard. There's been times for years where we had no money at all and we, we've had some, a lot of ups and downs. But for the most part, we're very happy with the, uh, the way things have turned out. So there's really degrees of, of where we could go. Uh, the one is feature films, which is, the one I'm most familiar with, and that's what I'm going to speak to probably the most in the next quarter of an hour. And then this TV series, which is something we've just started doing. A TV series, web series, it's, it's the idea, the difference between a feature film and a TV series is the, that a feature is, is a, is a once-off supposed to be the most important the uh, a TV series is a, a world that you've created that can have a hundred episodes exist. So basically you should never have uh, a TV series with, with one strong plot. A TV series is a world, you're creating a world and, uh, and that's a really big distinction uh, because it's, it's, it changes the way that you are, that, that you approach the storytelling. Games and VR, there's a massive opportunity for that. Uh, the, the, the games work that we do at the moment is, is mostly servicing, uh, but there is definitely, that is the fastest growing sector of the, of the entertainment industry. The difficulty with games is that the, we, we compete with these, you know, the games we work on are, are sometimes $200 million games that we will do a, a small, small portion of, uh, but the odds of us raising Two hundred million dollars to make our own game is is very very low at this stage. So the service model for that is, is still the best for us. Uh, although you can do much cheaper games and uh, that, you know that you can produce yourself. Uh, and then VR, virtual reality, augmented reality. I think that's something that we should shouldn't ignore. It's a really uh, powerful um, new. Uh, uh, way of uh, telling stories and interacting with with uh, the, the client with the audience other seeds of course is uh, um, you know the, the architectural walkthroughs prototyping um, uh, explainer videos and uh, in, in medicine they're starting to use CG a lot, uh, all that kind of converges with some, uh, but there's a lot of changes of just doing piecemeal work uh, in those areas as well. Uh, but the, the main kind of two categories of opportunity is, is service or original. Service is the when it has a project that the work we do for BBC is, it's kind of everything that side in London we just do the the the, the picture of it so that's a service relationship Th those relationships are great because it's uh, it's very simple they, we don't take that much responsibility if things go wrong uh, it's this contingency and you can work around it um, the other model is original where you have come up with your own story and you want to get that story out to the world and then you have to raise the money, you have to get the actors, you have to put everything in place, the music, the sound, the mix, the technical, technical specs of, of it, and then you have to find 
the distributors and you have to do everything. So basically that's when you produce, you're the producer. And that's, that's what we've done with Zambezia and Kumba. It's definitely the, the route that we like the most, but it is uh, also the, the most challenging because it's, it, you know, you have to build credibility to get to that point. So I'm going to talk a bit about feature animation and uh, and the I think the the key will be uh, uh, this, this is is stuff that I, I there is lots of other ways of doing it and I'm just going to go through what I've what, what our experience has been in the the workplace in, in the, the marketplace. So um, Zambezia has done really well. It was released around the world, 26 different languages, uh, lots of different versions uh, of the of the way it was marketed and dubbed and uh, Kumba also did very well and appeared uh, globally in um in in all over the world uh, the as far as the success goes we we're right up there in, in terms of south africa's most successful films and i believe it might be africa's most successful films uh, zambezia's second Kumba is fourth and the uh, you can see how animation is a fantastic opportunity to tell stories because the it, it really does stand out and it can be dubbed into different languages for different cultures. The uh, globally, we've sold nine million tickets for our two movies over the last uh, four or five years, and it's uh, our biggest territory being China, uh, where we sold about one and a half million tickets uh, over the, the two movies. Um, as a, a bit of a, a um, why we why global is so important is this. Uh, I'm hoping you can see this graph. The the, uh, the 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 way this is split up is the the income that we've received from different countries around the world. This is for both movies. And if you can see the the, the graph, you can see that the U.S. Canada is still the biggest territory by far. Uh, the United Kingdom next, uh, Benelux, which is Belgium, Netherlands, Netherlands and, and Luxembourg, for some reason we do very well in uh, France. And then the whole of Africa is, is only about 5% of that and, and comes in, in about fifth or sixth position. So it shows you that, uh, and, 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 and let, let me just say that these, these movies have only just, just broken even, so they've only just covered the production budget. So the, the, what we have basically got here is where the production budget comes from. And you can see that 5% of the production budget comes from the continent of Africa. Uh, if we weren't looking globally, we would be horribly bankrupt by now and we would not be able to attract investment again. Um, and then this is a, a, a map of the, the, the basically the company, the kind in the world that produce animated feature films for the world market, for the global market. And you can see um, most of them are in North America and there's a very few uh, in the rest of the world. There's, there's one in Japan, there's, there's one in, in Australia, which is connected to, to Warners. Uh, Ardman is in the UK and Illumination, which of course is connected to Universal, is in Paris. Uh, we are the only ones really in the uh, emerging markets that are producing films for the multiplexes. China has a massive animation industry, but it is very self-sufficient, so it doesn't need to export outside. Uh, it can make all its money in China and makes more money in China than it would in the rest of the world put together. Uh, so it, it, it just shows you the, um, the there's a big gap in, in world, the, the world, people who are making animated feature films from outside of the of the US and Europe. Uh, there are two types of films. There's, there's mainstream films, which I think we can all, we're all familiar with, and then there's non-mainstream films, which is things like um, Song of the Sea, which is out of uh, Dublin, uh, Walls of Bashir, which is the Israeli um, documentary, and um, uh, Spirited Away, which of course won the Oscar and did, did really well internationally it was a Japanese film but these films generally don't uh, make any business at all. Song of the Sea was a five country co-production between Ireland, Luxembourg, uh, Germany, I, I can't remember all the countries but 
it's, they, they use soft money from different uh, U European Union uh, states who contribute to the budget. I think it's probably made, I think, not even a million dollars from the box office in return. It was a seven million dollar budget. And um, I'm not sure about, about the others, but I think Walsh with, Walsh with this year made six million dollars. It cost a great deal more. Um, no, in fact, you can look at movies, don't films funded. They're not funded by the, uh, the market. Spirited Away, outside of Japan, made very little. Zambezia beat it and Kumba beat it. But in Japan, it made $220 million. So it doesn't need the rest of the world. That's the, how strong the Japanese market is. But we don't have that market here. Um, the multiplexes is really what we're aiming for uh, as a company. And that means the, the you know these these big uh, cinemas that that show six or seven movies at a time, and that's where we want to do. Um, and I'm just, uh, we we've been doing in South Africa to stimulate the industry and how we could hopefully um, see more of that happening across the continent. In South Africa, uh, in yeah, 15 years ago, I started Animation in South Africa. Uh, that still runs today, and that lobbies governments to try and help and, and engage more and more with um, with the uh, the industry and, and 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 provide money and funding. Uh, the International Animation Festival; those things are really important. Animation Exchange is a simple thing where we get people to go to. Uh, visits to, to, to universities to watch animation. We just you just get enthusiasts and you just build an audience and a community around animation. The African Animation Network is a new thing, and they they're working with Discop to to get uh, uh, people to pitch into the market. Um, Animate Africa is something we're running now, which is also about helping other organisations uh, get uh, get going. And then the Story Lab is something I'll just talk briefly about if, if I've got time. Um, and it's something we launched, which I think was really successful, and I'm really encouraging more of, the, of these kinds of initiatives. The, the Story Lab was something we came up with when we realized we needed to open up as a production company to find new talent with, with new ideas. And so we went to Disney and we asked them for some assistance and mentoring, and we went to, the, to our local government to get some funding, and we put some money in ourselves, and we ended up going on a, uh, doing this big launch and we ended up getting 1,400 applicants from around the continent, 35 different countries, and we came up with, um, we, we chose three, four TV series and four feature films to, to continue development on. And uh, we took the, the um, all, all the winners uh, went over to Los Angeles and Disney gave us a two-week immersion and Disney have since then been uh, mentoring us with, uh, with developing the, the TV series in, in particular. And TV series is, is an interesting thing because it's, uh, it's all about the characters, really. It's, it's the characters is everything. If your characters are strong, they have strong relationships with other characters then it's, uh, that, that's what, what, what they look for in TV. And that's, that's probably half the battle one. If you can find very strong characters who have strong relationships with other characters, and there's usually one heart. And um, it would take me a few hours to, to try and explain all the, the learning around the TV. But the main thing is to, to really look at what's out there already globally. And um, there is definitely a... A, an interest. We've taken like, this this program, Mama K Super Four. We took to uh, Mipcom and Annecy, and there's a huge interest in it. We've just signed a deal now where they're going to going to put in a few uh, m more funding to create a pilot and to create a uh, animatic and some test animation. And uh, this is is going to go uh, hopefully into production. Uh, uh, in the next couple of years, and this is is. Uh, a, a great Zambian project that uh, that there was a lot of interest from a lot of different uh, distributors because I think there, there is a, a, an awareness now that the um, that the people want more of a balance to to world entertainment. Um, Animate Africa is our um, a new thing that we've been putting together, which is just really we're looking at going over to like the. Face 
folks in the Googles and the Microsofts uh, to, to try and raise bulk funding to look at, at getting a whole lot of different projects. Uh, ideally, the people that live on the continent, and we, if we can find the, the, those genius talents, then we could find really world class, we could produce feature films and TV series that could really perform well on the world stage. Um, and the, the, the three main areas that we work on is uh, to, to discover new talent, uh, to develop it, and to, to support projects that develop talent, and then to get it onto the screen, which is really uh, the key, that people could see it. And, um, and then in the, in the development stage, making sure that we, we hold ourselves to a world-class quality and we don't, uh, we don't, we don't get, get phased on anything. So uh, in conclusion, I just want to say um, the um, put me back. But yeah, in conclusion, some. Uh, content from different a different part of the world that's not uh, the US, it's not Europe. And I think that we've seen the distributors going, what else have you got? And, and it's, it's a really nice story going on. I think the world's in a bit of a, a difficult time at the moment politically, and it, it really plays well to uh, a, t a time for artists from Africa to bring their own stories, but and, and I, I of doing that for another presentation is to make sure that your stories do play globally because uh, unless you can find a model where it's all soft funded and you don't have to recoup the money, it's very very hard to make completely local stories work only in a local culture. You you really have to look at the whole world, and I think there's an imperative to that. Uh, it's important that we actually as a as a continent start telling our stories to the whole world so that the whole world can actually begin to, to, to see different sides of this continent which uh, people know very little about. So I think that's, that's my time up and I'll be able to answer questions at the end. Um, thank you very much, Start. We really appreciate your detailed presentation and uh, I'm sure there's a lot to to check out from the <laughs> slides and the especially the charts that you have presented thank you very much like we said we will be taking questions at the end of the session so we will be moving next to the second presenter now, who should be Benga Ajetomobi, but he is out now. I think he has problems with his internet. So we'll be moving next to the third item, which is meeting the needs of the industry, technical know-how. And this is going to be presented by uh, Sendebo from Animation West Africa. Um, you have uh, attention, Sendebo. Uh, hi. Hello. Um, oh, hello. Oh, great. Hello, all. How are you doing? <laughs> um, sorry, I wasn't. I wasn't really ready to come in right away. But since the guy who's supposed to to come in has uh, taken off for a second, um, just bear with me while I finally <clears throat> just set my alarm and everything. Um, so please give me a second. Ooh, uh, right. Second place, need to finish it up. Yeah, I was just I was just getting myself all set for for the guy to come in. All right. 
So, um, I think I'm set now. Uh, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, we can. Right, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Abel. But uh, um, people call me Sen, and that's been uh, Sen, Sen Debo, that's how my name sounds basically put together. And um, don't bear with me when I, I'm reading also some things I've, I've prepared out here. Um, uh, let's see, let's see how to share your slides with me. A second. Just want to just want to do a screen share and. Uh, All right. Can you, uh, right. Okay. So, um, my name is Debo, like I said, Saint Debo, and uh, I am the founder at AWA Foundation, and extensively, um, <clears throat> also the chief servant, as I call myself, at Animation, the Animation West Africa Network, which is a, a community, online community, similar to CG Africa, to be honest, and. Uh, the whole idea started with me being uh, around the, the first man I just spoke, Stu Forrest, because uh, I work with, with the company in, in, in South Africa and Cape Town. Um, but AWA is intended to serve as a pool, as a database, a community for all persons involved in the animation industry, similar to just basically what CG Africa is also about, and it's good to have efforts in several areas. Um, I believe you can see my inch, my uh, what right now, my what I'm sharing. So the things I'll talking about quickly in 15 minutes that I have is uh, intro to what technical know-how is, what it is, what it isn't, um, application locations and implications of the lack of it, requirement of a technical artist job I've found, uh, some of my experiences, issues of technical know-how to individuals, known problems to our industry in Africa, and uh, of course I'll put my my my. Uh, coming mostly to West Africa, where I know a bit also about. And uh, challenges and suggested solutions to save the industry and conclusion. Now I'm gonna try and model all of this together in a way so we can be as quick as possible within uh, 15 minutes. Um, now to start, with, now what is technical know-how? You know, um, to define technical know-how, in my opinion, technical know-how is a term for practical knowledge and how to accomplish something. You see, as opposed to a know what, as opposed to know why, as opposed to know who. Now, we, we could model all those things together, right? We could model it together and think technical know how is the same as know what or know why, which is the science, why something happened. No, a technical know how is often a tacit knowledge. What tacit, tacit talks about something that cannot be taught somebody else, something that you learn. And in my, in my note here, which is just all over the place, um, tacit knowledge is like not the same as formal knowledge. It can't, it can't be written down. It's not the same as implicit, which you're not writing down, but you could write it down. Neither is it explicit, things that you basically can, can demonstrate and put out. No, tacit is something that you've been able to, to develop as a result of uh, uh, experiences, insights, emotions, intuitions, observations, and uh, some sort of internalized uh, information that you've had over time. Now, and this is where technical know-how becomes a little bit tricky, to be honest, because I would assume that because I can do this, that means I have a know-how about it. Absolutely not. What you know is know what. You know the facts about that thing. You know why that thing works. You know know who. That's the communication. But know-how is something that grows with you over time, but you've been around it, but you haven't done it. So I am given a, a, a definition here that says that, uh, Technical know-how is therefore how to deal with a problem in a precise, specific, and logical manner, which ensures efficiency, right, and effectiveness, and that depends on where it applies. It has it is on the doing, it is on the acting, and it has got to be a precise, specific, and in a logical manner. The whole idea of it is just to basically get efficiency and effectiveness. If you ain't got having efficiency and effectiveness, technical know-how is not working for you. Um, I see uh, my time is running, to be honest. I'm, I'm very honest with you guys. This topic is, is something I could speak for in about an hour, but I'm just going to put it quickly as much as I can and hope you can get something. Uh, okay, moving on. So let, let's go back up there. Talking about applications and implications of, of a lack of it. Okay, 
Um, what, what I put here on my, on my site is, if you look at our industry, right, in Africa, it's a bottom industry, something that's still coming up. We will, like, like Stuart was saying, you know, when he goes out there and the first question they're asking him, oh, we don't know this, how is that working? Oh, and, and then they want to embrace some things, you know. It is an industry that people don't really know too much about, to be honest, and that behoves on us to, to do the best that we can. But when we compare our industry, see, to the likes of uh, the bigger industry out there, Hollywood and the big studios and whatever, I think it's not actually appropriate to begin to consider the, the knowledge that we have. Because one reason is there's technical know-how, person and environment of teamwork. Let's see, I think I got that one, I got that one written somewhere. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be, yeah, technical know-how is most understood in an environment of teamwork. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm basically trying to uh, do a, a, a few things at the same time. Uh, right, so what I mean by that is because most of us in, in Africa may, at least a part I know, West African that I know, even, even in Southern Africa, most individuals I understand are more of a one-man army kind of thing, like me and a friend are doing something or me myself alone it, 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 it sees that technical know-how is not something that we 100 percent bring to the fore except when we work in a team let me try and read some of the things i have on the side here um right so i may not be able to speak about africa as a whole in this regard except one automatically assume that africa is just lacking behind always no i don't want to assume that that's a bit retrogressive the, the, the idea is uh the ex expectations that we have about Africa, if we compare it to the bigger world, yes, we would say that we are not up there yet. And uh, oh, sorry, just bear with me, guys. I'm just trying to put things together here. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So um, we, we may not be, there's a few reasons we, that I said we may not be able to be on that level could basically be because we're not all the time working as a team. It's not in a team-based environment, okay? One of my most most uh, uh, recent, uh, the idea I can bring back to my head is my experiences. Um, if, if you go back up here, you'll see I, I, I put experiences in all. Um, experiences I, I, I can remember is basically working in Triggerfish again. I mean, I work in Triggerfish, I work in some other studio called Character Matters out there in, in Cape Town. Um, there is this guy called Mike Buckland. Right, Mike is, in my opinion, at, at that time anyway, about, about the, the great, greatest technical director that we have run in Africa. And what Mike would do is, it's not about knowing all the software, but because the production needs something to be done, because production has a, have a direction they want to go to, Mike would basically sometimes stay over in the office and find a way of a handshake between all of the departments going behind the scene. All you just do is come back in the morning and things seem to be working. You need somebody like that in an organization that has to do with 3D or, or 2D computer graphics. You need somebody like that in a studio, a person that is not necessarily bothered about, okay, how skilled you are, but how the little skill you have or that people have can work together. That is a technical know-how. May I say that this topic I'm handling, which is basically uh, meeting the needs of the industry about technical know-how, it's not necessarily, uh, a, a, a hardware thing. Actually, I'm not talking about hardware right now. Neither am I talking about software. But I'm talking about the know-how behind that makes your hardware and your software work together. The, the, the things that ensures efficiency at the end of the day. Um, let, let's come down home quickly. But, but areas of our technical know-how sometimes that we avoid going into that affects our industry uh, could be around the engineering, the, the, the programming part of software. You know, uh, how many people is writing software in our industry? I, I really don't know what well, asset concerns 3D and, and 2D applications, you know. Um, we sometimes don't venture into other parts of computer graphics as a whole. Uh, I know and the time I used Maya a long time ago, I know something called mail script on it. Don't know how many people really use it, but you know, de developing scripts and plugins to make our work easier. And there's something about trying to not be like, Hollywood on the, on the likes, you know, looking what, get our own industry working, think about the things that we're doing in our industry and how we can write 
codes and, and, and plugins to work for us, to generate, to produce exactly the things that we want in the way we want. As you was just talking now about, about China, who is pretty much self-sustaining. Everything they do is within them. You know, everything they produce is for their people. I'm not saying we should be like that. But I mean, we can in some ways realize that we can provide solutions for our own self. And that requires a great deal of technical know-how. Now, let me dash down quickly. Um, some, some people, you know, for instance, someone could be bad at, at, at modeling, for instance, you know, and then we have somebody, somebody else who understands how edge flows could work. Somebody could uh, uh, understand anatomy very well. Again, when I was reading Trigger Face, a guy called Sam, Sam King. Sam would basically sit down and study anatomy. He's a, he's a 3D guy. And I remember I would lean over his shoulders now and then and see what he's doing. In that sometimes I disturb him anyway, because when you lean on someone's shoulder, you're just basically disturbing them, looking over. But he would study uh, uh, three, uh, uh, the, the human anatomy. And that helps him in his workflow as a modeler and, and as a painter, as, as a painting artist, he's a painter that he is. You know, and that is where technical know-how basically starts, to be honest. Now, um, the art of creativity may be far from some people. People can know how to use ZBrush, Blender, Mockbox, but it doesn't guarantee the knowing those tools is actually the same as being able to apply those tools to work together. I'm going to emphasize one thing. Technical know-how works with a team 100%. It works about collaboration. I see why I got down there again. Right. I said the idea of being, uh, being technical could be in two forms then. Having a craft, what you're doing, and having an understanding of that craft. It is the understanding of that craft that, on, that, that makes you see where, how it is connected to your end objective in mind, right? You have a craft of what you do, you have a, a display of whatever you can do, but then how does it link? How does it get you there? Now, when individuals work, as I'm talking now, I'm talking about the challenges and the trouble at the same time. When individuals work all of the time, which is what we have in our own industry in Africa most of the time, when individuals are, individuals are doing this thing on their own, you may not necessarily need to use um, a whole lot of brain power getting some things done. What, you, you might take the next uh, two, three weeks to do something. But when you're working on a team and you have a deadline and something to produce, to, 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 to produce at the end of that time and have it done right, this is where technical know-how comes in place because you don't have time to waste around. You basically need to, to understand how to be effective and efficient and get the result in using the less, less consumption, less power, less overhead, and basically using the less, the, the minimal resources basically to achieve the optimum. Again, I worked, I worked with, with Sopo, it was, a, it was a, um, a little production for UNICEF in Malawi. They get with trading fish, and that was a good experience for me because we 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 got some things done with minimal budget. Okay, not that like I know the budget, but I know it's very minimal budget. And then we, we the, the things we got done, and and the director basically applauded us, and the units have actually accepted it. And the, the things we got done in a short time, I think it was about three weeks. It was a short uh, uh, short animation clip of about I don't know ten minutes or twenty something. I don't know, and and we got it done. And we had again my. We had to think around. You can't afford to put this and this in your scene. It's going to hot get rendered. Not only is it going to hot render, what ways can you avoid? What ways can you go around this? You know, those were the things that we had to create. We had to figure out. Now I'm going to start dashing down quickly. Um, when 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 Character Matters was going to do, uh, was it Lion of Judah, their own animated feature? They, I remember they brought in a guy called Eric Lissard. Eric Lissard is, I think, does he work with DreamWorks or something? They had to bring him. He's an animator, basically. They needed his technical know-how. They didn't say, there, there are a bunch of prof professionals that, that they're down there in Cape Town. But I mean, they had to bring somebody else who's done it before. It's not all about animating. It's who's done it before, who sees where it's going by standing here. They had to bring that person in. And that was one guy. And they, of course, paid him for whatever he did. You know. And this is the, the, the position of a technical artist, a technical person. You see, when we talk about forums now, because I need to run up in a couple of seconds, when you talk about forums, see the technicalities that people face in their day-to-day -day activity is why we need forums, for instance. Each Africa is a forum there. We have a few like that, like I said, Amisha West Africa has got forums. We got many others that have, a few others that probably don't even know, not only West Africa, North Africa, maybe, you know, South Africa and Amisha and SA is there. 
no, the whole idea is this. We got, um, no, let, let me get off sharing this. Let me come back to my, to see my own face now. Uh, how do you do that again? Uh, it's confusing. All right. Well, can you see me, anybody? Hello? Yes, we can. Debo, thank you. You can see my, my own face. Okay, I thought, all right, great. Yes. Anyway, I thought I was, I was sharing my, my, world, my view uh, thing the whole time. Right, um, what was I saying? The, we, we have forums like that, and all those forums, they're all, they're all around, but the reason people come to forum is basically, should basically be to learn things, to ask questions, to gain ideas. Someone who knows, meet somebody who doesn't know, I'm not talking about knowledge now, I'm just talking about what you know in the technicality part. And then you speak to that person, and the person can say, do this, do that. So you will do a big disservice to us in our industry if we will refuse to jump on the shoulders of forum. Communities like this. If we will refuse to jump on the shoulders of communities, because that is where we can basically uh, elevate ourselves as individuals. I often say sometimes, uh, what you think you know as an individual is what you know to do for yourself. When you're working with a team, which I've been fortunate to work with, it's a whole different idea. And this is where you got to do your bit, stand out, let the other person do his bit, and everything you think you know is not so relevant in the whole idea of a team because somebody else has to put all those things together. Now, quickly, um, I saw, uh, the, uh, what's that? There, there is a job, right? I, I was looking online quickly, for, um, and then I found this job, technical artist's job. And I'll tell you some of the things they laid out. You need to be able to show technical proficiency in the areas of uh, mentioned, you know, light detection, whatever. Okay, that's, and then I mentioned the uh, programming languages. I said that earlier on. Now, they wanted you to be able to customize art packages. This was a job of a technical person. You have to be able to customize things, okay? And streamline as, as much as possible for specific projects. That is in my definition above, say, how you do things for specific things to get answer and become effective and efficient. Now, they're, they're charged with investigating new techniques and implementing them. Now, you need good communication and good management skills. Come on, what do you need that for a technical artist's job for? Or for you as an individual who wants to be technical? Well, that's what they say. They need communication. Communication is what gets what you have in you, what you want people to work with in the direction you want them to go. Now, I see in our industry, that's, that's one of the challenges. I mean, I've been talking about challenges the whole time, now and then. Challenges is communication. I, I don't think we have a good manner of communication in our industry. And that is not pointing at nobody. That's just telling what I think, what I found out. Now, if we will begin to communicate, not only when things are not are working, but even when things are not working, not only when things are not working, but only even when things are working, then we, uh, we address the next person who can stand up and, and speak about our issue for us, you know, and, and talk about what they understand about that issue. That is part of the job of a technical artist. Quickly now, um, you need to anticipate the needs of the artist. Thank you. Say again. Say again. All right, go on. Go, go. We just right. for time, so because we are conscious of time around here, that's why. Sorry, I had to cut in. All right, so we need to, it says you need to anticipate the needs of the artist to streamline their productivity. Um, the technical artist acts as a bridge between the, the artist and programmer working on a project. So if you see this requirement, it looks as something you might just imagine like, okay, is this what I need to know? No, those are part of the things that, that, that we need to be aware of as individuals who is trying to think about technical know-how. You don't have to necessarily know all of those things, but be aware of it. You might be required. It is part of you. That is what makes a complete person. Now, I'm going to end quickly by talking about the solutions. I've mentioned them already. Just outlined them. I said solutions to save the artist and save our industry from uh, the personal doom that we might be headed for if we're not conscious of uh, the, the, the aspect of, of technical know-how. First of all, be open to new ideas. New ideas can come from any angle. Um, we need to improve our local, our, all the use of our own local content. I mentioned it earlier on. When we have to do our local content, we might be pushed to create plugin and software that will address it, that is specific and unique to our, our own industry. Again, we need to collaborate, share ideas, seek opinions. Forum, Basset CG Africa is there, others are there. Most importantly, you need to research, do research and development. Now, 
research and development is not just knowing something. It's basically knowing something to apply to something. If you're not practical in what you're doing, technical know-how is lacking. It's a practical part of everything. How you apply what you know towards your productivity, which talks about efficiency, effectiveness. Um, I think I should just write it up here. I've, I've said everything I'm trying to say over time in, in the course of what I'm saying, uh, in the course of what I've been saying that I've hoped. But um, it is, uh, it is inarguable that we have a people that has that, that have high skills and would be still with responsibilities however if we can do away with every man to himself spirit if we can do away with that it will push us towards teamwork and when we get towards teamwork then technical knowledge will become needed and we've got to do one thing before the other right leave every man to himself collaborate teamwork when you're working with a team you're trying to make team efficient and that is where technical or, or know-how becomes needed and uh, i think this is going to be the last word i'm, I'm going to say and um, thanks to CG Africa for inviting me. Thanks to audience who are listening. And I'm going to thank two people, um, Nkoro uh, uh, and Salem in Cyprus and Chukes Okoro in Nigeria. They were also helpful in me getting ready for this process. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Debo. Thank you, Debo. Thanks a lot. We do appreciate the hard work you put into your comment for helping us understanding technical know how. Like, um, I've did mention before the recording of this presentation will be posted to everyone and made public after this event tonight. Thank you. Um, I want to inform people listening that that uh, being a jet mobile of hybrid animation is having technical issues from his end. So we are currently making arrangements to see if he can resolve it. If he can't, um, we're looking at him recording his presentation offline and by this uh we might have to mail it to everyone offline so we can have his presentation so that means we will have to skip his presentation he was meant to be presenting on one of the challenges and he was meant to be discussing on hardware and software so which means we will have to go on to the next one which is going to be presented by Harry Dunku, the role of concept artists in creating local content. And Harry Dunku is from Scroll Entertainment from Nigeria, and I would want to pass the floor to him. Harry, you have, your atten you have our attention. Hello. Hi, Ari. Hello. Uh, no, we can't. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now, Harry. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. What about now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. Um, good evening, guys. Good evening, Harry. Thank you. Okay. My name is Harry Dunku. I'm a digital artist in Nigeria, based in Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I have been in the digital space for about five years now. Um, I have worked as a freelancer, and I currently own my own company, which I started, I founded in um, 2015, it's about two years ago. Um, the name of the company is Scroll Entertainment. So um, what we do basically at Scroll Entertainment is to um, solve problems for um, organizations um, by creating um, unique content, digital arts content uh, for the brands, basically. Um, so my clients are Diamond Bank, uh, Mary Beth, um, budgets, et salads, Vekid Benkisa, Western Lotto, and a bunch of others. So um, some of my works, this is, um, if you are based in Nigeria, you probably would have seen this. Um, this work is, can you guys see my screen? 
Yes, we can, Harry. Okay, great. So um, this work um, is um, on, I think it's still currently displaying on all Diamondback ATMs in Nigeria. So um, if you are based in Nigeria, you probably would have seen this work. Um, this was for Diamond Bank. The both of them were for, for Diamond Bank. Um, this other guy on the right was also for Diamond Bank, a concept character for Diamond Bank. Um, and this was also done for Diamond Bank as well and was published in newspapers in Nigeria. Um, some other concept works I've done, I did this um, concept uh, character for, uh, this is actually a concept character based on the designs that was given, that was given to me um, to be done for Vortex Comics. Um, Vortex Comics is a comic uh, entertainment company based in Nigeria, in Lagos, Nigeria. And this character was called um, Ogun, that's the god of iron, okay. Um, these are some other characters I created. I created these characters for um, a book that was recently launched in Lagos. Um, she's, the one on the left is a um, young, upwardly mobile, average Nigerian female from Edo State, Nigeria. Um, and this other, these two characters on the side are twins for the book as well. So, um, these are some other works I did in my spare time. Uh, this is, um, this work was based on me just trying to tell the story of how uh, um, a good looking girl can, <coughs> sorry, a good looking girl can turn out to be pretty tough, like having um, an alligator as a pet and stuff like that. Uh, this work was done um, to, to convey my, working hours, how that I spend um, about 10,000 hours literally um, of ridiculously crazy practice, um, um, sometimes working into late nights and stuff like that. So uh, this was just to um, to communicate the, the idea behind that hard work, my hard work. This was also another character I created in, I think about two years ago, based on a legendary, um, a legend, a legend called Queen Amina or of Zaira in Nigeria, a 3D concept I did. Uh, this particular work was um, a concept I did in 2015. Um, I entered, I did this work for a, um, at competition um, organized by Samsung in Nigeria, and I came second in the competition. Um, the story is, the idea behind the painting is um, trying to portray uh, Lagos, the city of Lagos, um, the cityscape of Lagos in the future. Um, we have like flying cars and stuff in the, um, in the air, and then we have like this uh, major uh, landmark um, which is currently in Lagos right now as we speak. You know, the idea behind this work was to show that um, even through the passing of time, we still have Asian landmarks, uh, you know, that are, um, that survive through the years, you know. So, yeah, and I think I titled this work 17, Echo 1701, something like that. So the idea behind that um, is that um, even um, in the future in Lagos, because Lagos is like a very populated city, so even in the future, we still have like, despite the, fa the fact that cars are levitating and stuff, we still have like um, traffic situations and stuff like that. Okay. So um, let's, let's go straight into the meat of the conversation today. Um, the question basically is what is concept art? So um, there are many ways to define concept art, but I think in a nutshell, concept art is just um, what you do, the the it's actually the it can actually be defined literally based on what the word is you know so concept art is actually an art that is based on a concept so um if for example you want to do a movie or you want to do um, an animated feature film or you want to design a game or something it usually always starts with concepts so um a concept art is based on the story so um concept art is always driven by the story the narrative um, based on the right the writer and um, whatever it is that the director or whoever it is 
that is the um, or who is directing the projects um, gets to gets to do. So um, basically, the major influences in concept arts um, because concept arts actually influences three major industries. Um, we have other industries like literature industry and stuff, but I, I think that majorly uh, the film, the animation, and the game industry um, are driven or the concept actually drives these three industries majorly. Um, in the film industry pipeline, for example, you have um, a, a script or a, sc a screenplay um, in pre-production phase. So the concept art is so concept art is so important that you actually have to do concept art uh, before things like storyboard, for example, because it just just right after a script or a screenplay is produced, you have to do concept art. So um, concept arts for um, a movie uh, would entail engaging different different artists, different digital artists who would, um, based on the story or the script or the narrative, uh, they would come up with different images, different ideas, different um, environmental designs, character designs, uh, production designs, set designs, um, even vehicle designs and crazy things like that, um, props and things like that. So it's up to the concept artists to come up with all these things right before um, major production like storyboarding and the actual shooting of the film um, takes place. Um, and then in an animation pipeline, for example, um, the concept art usually comes in, in the same way as the film um, industry, whereby um, just right after the script, you have to um, design concept for the characters, um, the environment, and production design, and things like that, and also in the game industry. So um, I am very humble, like um, Stuart said, uh, the truth is, I don't know everything, and I have taught a lot of people, like I still do teach a lot of people in Nigeria, and uh, I've done a lot of trainings in digital arts, and I always tell them that um, I am one of the most down-to-earth person when it comes to learning stuff, I'm very open to learning stuff, and I'm so open that I even, most, most of the times, I usually end up learning stuff from the students, <coughs> sorry, I usually end up learning stuff from the students themselves, so I, what everything I'm saying or everything I'm going to say is not necessarily cast in stone. I'm just giving my own interpretation of what's based on my experience, um, of what I believe um, would work for you. It might not work for you, you know, but it's just uh, my own two cents, and hopefully it will be beneficial for you um, in the course of your career as a, a digital artist. So. Um, the major challenge that I have found, basically, um, in digital arts, and especially in Africa, because um, right now we are at a very, very infant, uh, very, very infant phase. The industry is really small, like it's so small in Nigeria right now that we happen to know each other, you know. And um, it, it's humbling because it also makes us realize that we actually have to um, come together and, and collaborate in order for us to move the industry forward. Um, so the major challenge that I found basically is um, the, the battle between money and passion. So for the average freelancer, um, I'm, speaking to, I'm speaking about myself as well because I was once a freelancer. You know, this, this um, battle in our head as to um, whether we should do stuff that we love to do or whether we should do stuff for money. So there's always... Um, um, as long as you are an artist, you always have to fight this battle in your mind. Um, you find yourself in situations whereby even to as little or as basic a stuff as posting or creating artworks for Instagram, your Instagram handle, for example, you're actually caught between creating stuff that you love to do and um, creating stuff for money. So um, most times when clients clients um, call me, I found that most times, uh, my own personal experience though, most times I found that uh, the work that I do based on, that I'm passionate to do, ends up being much more interesting than, the, um, than what is given to me um, based on me having to deliver or me being paid. So I find it more interesting to do a 
what I'm passionate for than to do a paid job. So as a concept artist, you always have to um, choose. You get to that crossroad where you have to choose between money and passion. And, and for most people, um, for most people, passion might be having to um, create, do characters like superheroes from international comics or international movies, as opposed to creating or thinking of characters from Nigeria. You know, I, I used to have this challenge with um, local artists in Nigeria, whereby uh, where they used to um, they end up doing more fan art than trying to create new characters. And I'm like, dude, why are you guys? Can't you guys just try to? Why don't you? look inwards why don't you try to create a new character because um uh, sincerely speaking I, I because um i haven't worked with so many international um companies but i believe that um to get a job to land a job in maybe disney or marvel for example you have to have a portfolio of original characters not a portfolio of fan art so i've always been of the opinion that and i used to um, encourage artists to ensure that you spend more time creating your own unique characters and and for the same way for a musician for example they say that the best songs are written when you are going through the stuff that you're actually singing about you know so i think that as an artist you you should tell more about your experiences you know tell more i'm telling more about your experiences the arts that will resonate more with people is when you tell original stories based on your own experiences look back at your past look back look back at what you're going through at the moment and try to tell stories about it recently on my instagram page i i i, I started doing um um content or i started doing artworks based on things like music because i love music a lot you know so that's my passion um that's the passion side but on the money side you have to think of when clients give you jobs you have to think of most times jobs don't necessarily most of the jobs i get in nigeria are um, locally inspired jobs so of course i have to do local stuff well um, as opposed to um as opposed to the average person like i said which is an advice um you have to try as much as possible to balance between the money and the passion side if the money side is giving is requesting for you to do more of local contents, embrace it. If the passion side is more of trying to do fan arts, I would suggest to, more of trying to do fan arts for international characters and things like that, I would advise you that you try to cut down on that and look inwards, look, look at your experiences, look at um, what you've been through, look at what you're going through, look at your current environment, look at the city of Lagos, if you're based in Lagos, look at your city in Africa, wherever it is that you are, and try to, um, Try to tell stories or try to create um, artwork and concepts are based on your experience, your current experiences in um, wherever you are. So moving on to um, some basic form facts that might be of interest to you. Um, the anime market in Japan was worth more than 1.6 trillion trillion yen. That's about 1.14.1 um, billion dollars in 2014. Uh, and around 60% of the world's animated TV shows originates in Japan. So why is this fun fact important? The truth is, the anime industry is self-sufficient, like Stuart said, um, it's self-sufficient in itself, in, in fact that they have the market already. And right now, if you look at Africa, the market isn't really there. You know, we are just starting out. Now. The average person in Nigeria doesn't really um, embrace the medium of animation and uh, digital art, basically. Uh, so we have a problem to solve. And what's the problem? The problem is that we have to look inwards, look for local content, um, look for things, tell stories that people are um, can resonate with, uh, people can relate with, you know. And that's basically that. Everything still boils down to, to content, local content creation, and anime. The anime market or the anime stu um, industry, for example, is a perfect example of how that Japan looked, um, the Asian market, uh, Japan and China looked inwards to create their own um, their own content. Uh, of course, we cannot compare the current um, animation industry in Nigeria because um, Japan is about 17, uh, started in about 1917, so that's a long time ago, and we are just about starting out. So, but the idea is we need to look inwards because um, there's something I always say to, you don't expect um, an American artist to be able to tell a Nigerian story better than you. Um, if you played the video game um, Call of Duty, uh, there was a scene of Lagos, you know, and I looked at it and I'm like, cool. But if you really think about it, 
the people who are supposed to be creating the concepts, that concept for the city of Lagos in a game, in a AAA game like um, Call of Duty, are actually supposed to be artists from Lagos. You know, so but I don't blame I don't blame the um, the guys in the US because they probably looked at like, okay, we can't really find anyone who is doing stuff in Nigeria, which is the reason why we need to embrace local content creation. Because if we did, when they get to look out for us on places like Art Station, they uh, they look out for our portfolio on places like Art Station. They are inspired to want to engage us one way or the other, you know. So it's it's a client call to all digital artists to begin to look inward, especially um, those of us based in Africa. Um, so some uh, for those of us who are into uh, 3D modeling and things like that, because I've I've had requests um, for for me to create characters. Uh, there was one particular request that came on um, our, which is Africa West um, West Africa. Um, association on Facebook, they asked me to do um, a, a 3D um, character model sheet of um, Black Panda, and um, because they want the 3D artists wanted to model Black Panda. Um, the thing is, there is more than enough content online because people are probably thinking, where where can I find African content? The truth is that if you check Art Station, if you check um, Instagram, you check Pinterest and Google, you actually will see um, a lot, an awful lot of um, concept art. So I'm just going to slide over to my browser here. So you see, um, this is my Pinterest. This is Pinterest. Um, and I just searched for African concept art. And as you can see, there is an awful lot of, there's an awful lot of um, concept um, 2D concept um, artworks for us to use as reference to model characters in 3D for those of us who are in the 3D space. Okay, so we have ArtStation, Instagram. On Instagram, there's a guy called Nubia Nubia Mansi. Nubia Mansi um, posts stuff um, based on um, concept art, based on fantasy, African fantasy, and um, sci-fi. So if you follow someone like Nubian Mans, you can get more than enough concepts for you to create your characters in 3D. Um, also, we have africandigitalart.com and also African Digital Art on Instagram. Okay. Then um, my solution, because I actually thought about this um, after Femi talked to me about it. Um, I really appreciate um, CG Africa for what they are doing. I appreciate the fact that they are very passionate about um, the digital art industry, uh, the CG industry in Africa. Um, I appreciate them for this opportunity also to be speaking to you guys. And um, I actually thought about it since the last time we spoke. And I actually realized that I had an idea at some point that I started out, but I did not um, um, follow through with it. It's called the Sketchathon. So the same way you have like hackathons where um, IT guys come together and they get to brow, um, they get to um, um, brainstorm and create new, um, new solve problems basically in the IT space. Uh, we can have like our own sketchathons or something. Uh, scroll, scroll sketchathon is something that is based on that idea and it's something that um, an idea that I've had for a very long time. And um, having spoke to um, Femi. Of CG Africa, I'm going to go ahead to make sure that we start this. So um, we'll be doing this um, regularly, maybe like um, once every two months. So we'll just have like um, artists from Nigeria, from Africa, from all around Africa, South Africa, and all parts uh, of Africa um, to engage artists to um, spend like maybe 24 hour, if 24 hour period of just drawing, sketching, uh, uh, painting, and doing concept stuff. Uh, we hope that with this um, initiative, we'll be able to inspire the creation of more local content in Africa. Um, and it's going to kick off real soon, like um, hopefully in the next one month. So um, if for those of us that are watching this um, webinar, hopefully um, I would um, share the link or something, or I'll share the link with um, CG Africa. So when the time comes, you guys can take part in it. And it would be, I believe this would be of huge benefit to the CG industry uh, for those of us who are looking for concept arts to create. Oh, thank you. 
So yeah, that's basically my um, presentation. Um, this is my handle on Instagram. You can find me easily. Um, my name is consistent on all platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, everything. Thank you very much. Oh my. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Harry. We really appreciate your diligence in putting everything together. And we we really enjoyed your strat slides. There's loads of uh, information which we have to digest afterwards. Um, we are being pushed for time now, so we need to move quickly to Brian from Kenya, who will be discussing the the importance of uh, using social media to expand the market in Africa. We've, we know Stuart has talked about the size of the market, so definitely we need to do something at least to expand the market. And we, we would like to listen to Brian to see what he has presented for us in doing this. Thanks, Brian. Hi, Brian. Can you hear us? Hello. Hello. I think Brian is having some technical issues here. Hi, Brian. Yeah, uh, we can't hear you. No, maybe I want to check your microphone. No. Yeah. No, it's muted around here. I want to check your recording input. Okay, um, while we give you some time, Brian, to try and fix the microphone, we'll quickly take two questions, two or three questions from one, and I think I should direct one of these questions to one of them. I would love to direct to Stuart. You there, Stuart? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, uh, we've got a question here from Shedrak. He's from Nairobi, Kenya. And he's, he's got two questions. He said, how do you get talented creatives to collaborate? And two, 
how do you get relevant bodies to fund productions? I'm going to copy and paste his questions okay. into they, the chat so you can refer to it. Great. Um, well, good questions. The uh, in terms of how do you get creative people to collaborate? It's a it's an age old problem. Uh, creative people like to to have ideas and and uh, and push their their ideas. So when when they disagree with someone else's idea, then it's uh, very easy to to get into disagreements. And what the way to to approach it is to make sure that. The, there is one director on a project, and that one yes. director, everyone agrees, must be in charge. And then everyone else sits and listens to that director's vision, and then they try and reach that director's vision. So, And that can be complex, because we have, at the moment, we have about 85 people working on a project. There's one director, and that director has to... There's other... 84 people are there to support the director's vision. So it becomes a very, very clear. Now a great director will be able to come into a, a situation and say, um, I, I'm looking for some options or this is, this is kind of where I'm going, but, but I, I, you, you know, if you're the, the concept artist, show me some ideas around that. And the great director will be able to bring the best out of the talent that, uh, that, that, that are, are kind of pitching ideas to 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 him or her but the the uh, everyone needs to understand going on that animation is a collaboration and that's just the way it is so it's up front that's the answer agree on it up front um, the second question around funding um where do you get the the, the funding that's that is the <laughs> You know, it's it's very very hard. We are very fortunate in South Africa to have had some quasi government funding. It's still commercial; they still want their money back and they want to make a profit on it. But it's a bit softer because they see it as developing an industry. So we 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 use a lot of government agencies to get funding. Plus, we go to Los Angeles once we've got a strong enough script. So that the the short answer is get the script and the concept and, and the business model um, absolutely excellent. If you've got an excellent script, everything else falls into place. If the script needs work, nothing falls into place because nobody wants to fund a broken script. So, And that's been our experience. I've gone to Hollywood a lot to try and, and raise money, but every time they've read the script and they've said it's nearly there, but it's not quite there, come back when you've got a, a better script. Mm -hmm. And we'll fund it, and I've not. It's it's tough because they hold you up to Disney standards. Mm. All right, thank you very much, sir. Thanks. Um, I've got another question here for Harry, and this is from Obioha Clement. He said, "Can one get better in digital painting and illustrations by trial and error?" And or with the guidance of an expert. I'm gonna copy and paste the question for you here as well, so you can refer to it. Okay. All right. So uh, that's uh, a good question. Like I said, um, I'm still a learner because uh, I follow people like uh, Aaron Blaze and. Um, some great guys out there um, and um, I hear them say that they are learning so who am I to say that I'm not learning anyways um, uh, digital painting and illustration by try and error no you cannot learn like the best ways to learn is intentional like learning has to be even when they say you put 10,000 hours it's not just 10,000 hours actually 10,000 hours of useful practice you know so it's not just putting 10,000 hours you have to be deliberate um, I do, um, and then one thing you have to do is um, try to get a mentor. Uh, try to get a mentor, try to follow some people, um, some people who have a particular style. Like for me, I, I, the people I follow on Instagram are intentional. I only follow people that, um, majorly follow people that are in the animation space, um, who are illustrators in the animation space. There are many great illustrators out there um, in, the com in, the, um, in comics and stuff like that. But if I did that, it would be like conflict. It would, it would conflict with uh, my um, goal and my um, personal career pursuits. 
at the moment. So um, I, I would advise that you get a mentor um, or get um, and then have some have people you follow. Um, there are curriculums. I think that you can get curriculums easily online. You can download curriculums from um, from prominent um, digital art. Um, in that curriculum, be itself. Like me, that was what I did. But if you want to learn um, from um, an academy or something, I think that you should go that route. But you have to, it can't be trial and error. It has to be intentional. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure he, Clement, has got the message uh, loud and clear. Um, I would quickly like to check on with Taros now, with Brian, to see if he's back. As other, otherwise, uh, we need to find out what we are doing. Um, hi, Brian. Hello. Um, okay. I think we might have to get Brian to make his recording offline. And um, we've gone way over time here we still have a couple of questions that has come in but like i mentioned we will make these questions available on the forums and i uh, would appreciate if our speakers can of course i'm going to follow you the link but take some time out to answer some of these questions we'll be making these recordings available and uh thanks for bearing with us whatever technicality issues that we've had tonight it's our first time but then we hope it's going to be the first of many that we will be having in cg africa so uh we will get better and i hope together we can make the industry progress and a couple of years time we're going to have to look back to this time and say yes we started with a great start and we are in a good place as an industry so specifically i want to thank our speakers for all the hard works they have put in thanks harry thanks george thanks debo thanks taros thanks uh Binga. and uh, thanks to all our listeners we had loads of people who expressed interests but then i think one of the challenges we're having also in africa is the internet and power because uh, the ratio of people who came online to the ratio of people who registered is disproportionate so i believe many people will be catching this up offline at some at some point yeah so thank you all i uh, thanks for your time i really do appreciate we will be ending the webinar now and uh, i want to sign up now say thank you all once again everyone bye Bye. Right. Cheers. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Femi. Right. Okay. Thank bye. Thanks to see you guys. Okay. Cheers, all. Thanks, Femi. Bye.